so our goal really is to describe complicated topological spaces in terms of simpler structures that we know more about and discrete mode theory is one such way of doing that it it helps with um understanding the topological space and calculating things about it like the homology for instance so before we get into that i will go through simple shell complexes a little bit just very briefly so an abstract simple shell complex is a collection of vertices and a collection of their subsets called simplices and if some subset is there all their subsets are there and all singletons are simplices uh the realizations of these simplicial complexes are topological spaces um here is a one simplex a zero simplex a one simplex a two simplex and a three simplex uh simplicial complexes are made up of these building blocks and here's a couple of examples of simplicial complexes so um a topological space can have multiple ways of describing it as a simplicial complex for instance if you consider s2 it can be represented as a hollow tetrahedron or a hollow octahedron both are simplicial complexes whose realizations are s2 um a d cell is just a closed ball of dimension d we are going to define what cell attachment is so if you have a topological space x and and a d cell you you take the boundary of the d cell and in a way glue it to the topological space using a continuous map um and this this is called attaching the d cell to the topological space x here's what it looks like so if you have a two cell let's say disk and a topological space x which is a plane in this case you have a map on the boundary of uh, d2 which is s1 and you attach it to the topological space with f so it's it's a quotient space really and this is what it will look like a cw complex is just a series of cell attachments except you have to start with a point a zero cell so for instance you can take a zero cell and attach a two cell to it in which case you will get a sphere a hollow sphere and then you attach a one cell and another one cell and you get this mickey mouse figure <laughs> um this is just an example of what a cell attachment looks like uh, a cw complex all of these are cw complexes just as um the same space could be represented in two ways as simple shell complexes you can also represent it in two ways as different cw complexes um i'll take the same example of s2 like we just saw you can attach a two cell to a point to get the sphere or you could do it slightly more complicated and take a point first attach one cell you'll get an s1 attach a disk on top and you'll get a hollow hemisphere and you attach a disk at the bottom and you'll get an s2 both these these are two different cw complex structures which give you the same topological space in the end some cw complexes are determined only by the number of d cells they have and not necessarily by the maps one such example is the wedge of d spheres um the wedge of the uh, n d spheres is all all the spheres connected at a single point for example here's the wedge of four s1s looks like a flower they are all connected at a single point the main theorem involving this is that if you take any cw complex obtained by attaching n d cells to one zero cell then that space is necessarily homotopy equivalent to um the wedge of n s d's this appears in multiple examples that we will see for some strange reason so it's quite important the proof of this theorem involves calculating the d minus 1 homotopy group of wedge n of sd that that it's zero and the proof of that um you you can prove it using the simple shell approximation theorem and induction by showing that wedge n of sd without a point 
is homotopy equivalent to wedge n of s d minus one. I won't be proving it here; it's kind of long. Um, before we go on to discrete Morse theory, I'd like to motivate it a little with classical Morse theory. This is going to be filled with a bunch of definitions that aren't too important to discrete Morse theory, but uh, I want to say I want to um, define the main theorem for this, and it'll need this. So, classical Morse theory is used to find CW complex structures for compact smooth manifolds. So here are a few definitions we are going to need. So given the smooth function f from m to r, a critical point p in m, uh, a point p in m is said to be critical if the derivative df at p is zero, and the Hessian matrix at p is the square matrix of second derivatives of f. A critical point is non-degenerate if the Hessian is non-singular. And its index is the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian. And now we define a Morse function in classical Morse theory. Uh, F is a Morse function if all the critical points are non-degenerate. That is, the Hessian is non-singular for every critical point. And this is the main theorem of classical Morse theory. So if M is a compact smooth manifold and F is a Morse function on M, let CP be the number of critical points of F with index P. Then M is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex where the number of cells of dimension P is CP. So I will illustrate this through the example of the torus. So here is the torus, and the most function we are going to consider is the height function on it. Um, the critical points of these happen to be P, Q, R, and S. And this is how it looks like. At the point P, it, it's just a point, it's just a dot, a zero cell. Between P and Q, everything you get is homotopy equivalent to this cup, bowl, whatever you'd like to call it. At Q, it looks like this. Between Q and R, it's homotopy equivalent to a cylinder. At R, it looks like this. Between R and S, it's a torus with a hole. And at S, it's, it's a full torus, at S and beyond. So, at the point and the bowl are homotopy equivalent. At this point, you're attaching a one cell, and another one cell, and then a two cell. So uh, here's a little animation to show how the progression goes. It goes all the way from down top. And that's all for classical Morse theory. Now we'll start with discrete Morse theory. First, we want to define a discrete Morse function. So given a simplicial complex K, a discrete Morse function is a function from K to R. So for any P simplex alpha, if you, if you take a P, P plus one simplex beta that contains it, uh, then F of beta, F of all the betas that contain alpha, which are such that alpha is a co-dimension one case of beta, must be of value um, strictly greater than alpha, except for at most one. You're allowed one violation of this rule. And similarly, if you have a gamma that's a P minus one simplex, co-dimension one case of alpha, then except for at most one of those, uh, F of gamma must be strictly less than F of alpha. These are the two conditions for something to be a discrete Morse function. Uh, a P simplex alpha in K is said to be critical if every beta for which alpha is a co-dimension one phase, F of beta is strictly greater than F of alpha. And for every gamma for which gamma is a co-dimension one phase of alpha, F of gamma is strictly less than F of alpha. That is, surrounding alpha, there are no violations of either two conditions. That's a critical simplex. So here's a small example of a discrete Morse function on this simplicial complex. Um, the ones circled are the critical simplices. For instance, seven, this, this one simplex is a critical simplex because it has exactly two co-dimension one phases, five and two. And five and two are both less than seven, so there's no problems there. And it has one phase just bigger than it, and that's nine. And nine is bigger than seven, so again, there's no problem. Uh, nine, for instance, this 
um, one simplex is not critical because it's a co-dimension one face of this two simplex and its value is equal. And we said that there should shouldn't be any violations of that rule. Similarly, all of these are critical one, three, five, two, seven, twelve, and the rest are not. I have to mention here that discrete Mosh functions always exist on any simplicial complex. Otherwise, there'd be no point. We are trying to work with discrete Mosh functions. Uh, and the reason is quite simple. If you consider the function that takes each p simplex to, to its dimension p, that is, that is a discrete Mosh function. Um, the only problem with this is we are trying to find discrete Mosh functions that have uh, very few critical simplices because we'll see later in the main theorem that that's what builds your CW complex. If every, in, in, in the example I gave you of the dimension function, uh, every simplex is critical and you don't want that happening. You want to reduce the number of critical simplices. So our goal is to uh, try and find nicer MOS functions. So here's a little lemma. It's quite important. It appears in practically every proof. Um, if alpha is any p simplex, then at least one of the conditions uh, of the definition of a critical simplex always holds. That is, either every um, bigger simplex for which alpha is a co-dimension one phase has value strictly greater than it, or every smaller one which is a co-dimension one phase of alpha has value strictly smaller than it. So it's a small proof, so I'll just prove this. Let alpha be some p simplex, v not up to vp. And suppose it's the face of beta v not up to vp plus one, and f of beta is uh, less than or equal to f of alpha. And suppose gamma is the face of alpha, and f of gamma is greater than or equal to f of alpha. That is, it has one problem here and one problem there. You consider the um, p simplex alpha dash, which is v naught up to vp minus one and vp plus one. Gamma is a co-dimension one phase of alpha dash, and alpha dash is a co-dimension one phase of beta. Now, since I already have one violator for uh, for beta, that is, it has something smaller whose value is greater than or equal to it. F of alpha dash must be strictly less than beta, since we said there can be at most one violator. And similarly, F of gamma must be strictly less than F of alpha dash. So if you go this way, we have F of gamma is greater than or equal to F of alpha is greater than or equal to F of beta. And if you go that way, you have F of gamma is strictly less than F alpha dash is strictly less than F of beta. So one way it's saying f of gamma is greater than or equal to f of beta. The other it's saying f of gamma is strictly less than f of beta. And that is a contradiction. So this cannot happen. So it can have at most one violator either above or one violator below or none, in which case it's a critical simplex. And that proves that lemma. Now we get to the main theorem of discrete modes theory. So if k is a simplicial complex and f is a discrete mode function on k, let CB be the number of critical simplices. Then the realization of K is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex, where the number of cells of dimension P is CP. So, like I said, we want fewer critical simplices for the MOS function so that you'll have a nice and simple looking CW complex structure. Um, to prove this theorem, uh, we'll need another couple of definitions, so I'll go through that. Uh, first, we'll define K of C. So, F is a discrete mode function on K, and C is some something in R. K C you define to be a subcomplex that is all simplices whose image under F has value less than or equal to C, and all their faces. So, K C has um, doesn't all the simplices in K C don't necessarily have. Uh, f value less than or equal to c because they may be the face of something whose value is less than or equal to c. This is worth knowing. We'll define what a simplicial collapse is. So if you have a simplicial complex k and you have two simplices, a gamma and an alpha such that gamma is a free face of alpha. Uh, a free, if gamma is a free face of alpha, it means that gamma is not a face of any other simplex in k. So if gamma is a free face of alpha, you consider 
the simplicial complex L that is K without gamma and alpha. This will be a simplicial complex. It can be checked. Then we say that K simplicially collapses to L. Now this definition looks strange. So here is why we say this is a simplicial collapse. This this simplex the simplicial complex is K. This space is what we call gamma, and this uh, two simplex is alpha. Uh, gamma is a free phase of alpha because it is it's not the phase of anything else and if you watch it collapses you can see it collapsing to um, k without gamma and alpha so in this case um, the realization of l will be homotopy equivalent to the realization of k or in other words, if you want to see these things geometrically, it just says that you are able to deform few things without crossing through any holes or creating any holes. So, of course, yeah, the geometric yeah. realizations just remains homotopy equivalent. That's true. You're just pushing it in, basically. Correct. Okay. Uh, for the proof of the main theorem, which I will not be doing, uh, <laughs> It involves um, one lemma and one proposition. That's it. After that, the proof is fairly simple, but they require. The lemma is that if you have some discrete mode function on K, then there is another discrete mode function G that is one to one and has the same critical simplices. Uh, not only does it have the same critical simplices, the one that I construct in the proof of this lemma, it's in the right up. Um, maintains all, all the inequalities between any two simplices. Now this proposition, so take K and a discrete mass function in, and some A less than B in R. So suppose there's exactly one non-critical simplex alpha with uh, F of alpha in, in the open A closed P, then either K of B is the same as K of A, or K of B collapses to K of A. So, Either way, uh, the realization of K of B is homotopy equivalent to the realization of K of A. And the other case is if there is exactly one critical D simplex alpha with F of alpha in AB, then uh, the realization of K of B is homotopy equivalent to uh, K of A after attaching a D cell to it. So the proof goes that you start, you go through the values of F slowly attaching a D cell whenever there's a critical simplex and it being homotopy equivalent otherwise. Uh, now, let's do some discrete vector fields. Now, most functions are nice and all that and you get a CW complex from them, but they are not very easy to construct in general. So you want to find a nicer way of getting most functions. And that is discrete vector fields. A discrete vector field V on a simplicial complex K is, is a set of tuples of simplices alpha, beta, such that alpha is a co dimension one phase of beta, and each simplex belongs to at most one of these tuples. It can't come twice. Now, a gradient vector field for a MOS function F on, on some simplicial complex K, we call it VFF, is a set of tuples of simplices again alpha, beta, such that alpha is a co dimension one phase of beta. And that it's a violator of that condition. F of beta is less than or equal to F of alpha despite being bigger in dimension values. Now, it's easy enough to show using the lemma that I proved before that a gradient vector field on a discrete Morse function is a discrete vector field. Now, discrete vector fields are far easier to construct than Morse functions are. And we know that gradient vector fields on most functions are discrete vector fields. We want to know when a discrete vector field has a most function that turns it into a gradient vector field. And for that, we will define a V path. So a V path is a sequence of simplices like this. Alpha naught is a co-dimension one phase of beta naught. Alpha one is also a co-dimension one phase of beta naught. And, and so on. All the alphas are phases of the betas that they are near. And the, the dimensions alternate. Alpha naught is a P simplex, beta naught is a P plus one simplex, alpha one is a P simplex, beta one is a P plus one simplex, 
and so on till alpha k plus one. And alpha i is not equal to the next alpha i plus one. Also, each alpha beta pair is in the discrete vector field V. So we said this is a V path, and we call this V path closed if a k plus one alpha k plus one is alpha naught. That is, it loops together. What you would expect. Now, now is the theorem. If V is a discrete vector field on a simplicial complex K, then there is a Morse function f on K such that V is the gradient vector field on that Morse function, if and only if there are no closed V paths. And at this point, we are no longer going to worry about Morse functions because from now, any example we try to do, we'll construct a discrete vector field, show that there are no closed V paths, and therefore it will have a Morse function on it. And also, I forgot to mention this, but if you notice, the critical simplices of F are exactly the ones that don't belong to the gradient vector field, which will be the same as a discrete vector field once we do this process. So we can uh, reduce it to just doing it with vector fields. Application one. We have gotten back to the torus now. So here's a simplicial complex for the torus. Uh, if you notice this and this are the same, they wrap around each other to form a cylinder. And this and this are the same, and they wrap around to form here. Whatever. <laughs> so as you can see, this is a pretty complicated simplicial complex, and it looks terrible to deal with. And you can't see any easy way of making a, getting a Morse function on this. So we are going to construct a discrete vector field. I, I just, there was no procedure for this. I listed an ad hoc discrete vector field on this. You can check that there are no closed paths here. Note that closed path is just following arrows and what you think of as a closed path, a loop. Uh, and now look at this discrete vector field and see which simplices are left out because those will be your critical simplices for the Morse function. Um, so you have one zero simplex. All these four vertices are the same, V naught. V naught is your zero, zero simplex that's not in capital V. V naught V4 and V naught V9 are uh, the two one simplices that are left out. And then there's V V naught V1 V4 and that's a two simplex. So these are the critical simplices for, for the gradient vector field of the Morse function that we get from this discrete vector field since it has no closed paths. And hence, we know that the torus can be made into, it has a CW complex structure that's made of one zero simplex, two one simplices, and a two simplex. And if you notice, this is exactly what we had back then from classical Morse theory. We'll move on to the second application, the K skeleton of the N simplex. The N simplex is just a simplicial complex of all subsets of the vertex set V naught up to V N. Uh, like we said before, the zero simplex is a point, the one simplex is a line, the two simplex is just a filled in triangle, the three simplex is a solid tetrahedron. The K skeleton of of any simplicial complex is the subcomplex of all simplices of cardinality less than or equal to k plus one. That is all the k simplices and lesser. Uh, in, in the case, the k skeleton of the n simplex is just all subsets of cardinality less than or equal to k plus one since every subset is a simplex in the n simplex. So for instance, if you consider the um, octahedron not solid, we, we said this was a simplicial complex for S2. This is its one skeleton. And this is its zero skeleton. Now, uh, we have no idea what, what the one skeleton is made of, what it looks like, what its homology is. It, it's not very clear. And it's definitely not going to be clear in higher dimensions. So we are going to find out what its CW complex structure is using this Morse theory. The claim is that the realization of the K-skeleton of an N-simplex is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of N choose K plus one D-spheres. Again, this isn't obvious either. 
So, so we'll come start to discrete vector field for this. Uh, the pairing is as follows: you take each simplex of dimension less than k that doesn't contain b naught. We'll consider b naught as special for this. Take any simplex that doesn't contain b naught and pair it to it union b naught. Now, this is a discrete vector field. It can be checked, and it doesn't have closed parts. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time, so I guess I won't prove that. So the simplices that are unpaired in V are B naught, and all the K simplices that don't contain B naught. Everything else will be paired to either something bigger or something smaller. So how many K simplices are there that don't contain B naught? And choose K plus one of those. And therefore, by the main theorem, you can tell that. Downward simplices are the critical ones, so V naught is a zero cell, and n choose k plus one are uh, d cells. So, so the realization of uh, the k skeleton is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of n choose k plus one series. And that's all for today. Thank you. Actually, since I seem to have another ten seconds, there is another nice example. <laughs> um, so this is a fairly complicated example. Uh, I'll just take another two minutes, if you don't mind. Sure, sure, go ahead. Um, so consider all disconnected graphs. There is one simplicial complex associated to these. So um, okay, this is. We will we'll, not go too into it. Let's call it N N. There's a simplicial complex associated to the whole collection of disconnected graphs, where the simplices are the graphs themselves. Um, the realization of N N is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of N minus one factorial S N minus three. This this is the main theorem, and this requires a very complicated construction of a discrete vector field. But while it is complicated, it would have been much harder to do it with a MOS function and or any other way really, because it's not even clear what this looks like without doing a few examples. So I'll just put this here. The rest of the proof um, in my write-up, there is there is an error over there. I I'll, I'll send you the corrected proof uh, later. And now I'll go back to thank you. <laughs> uh, can you come back to the twenty-third slide? Yeah. So uh, I'm a little doubtful about uh, maybe the notation or something because as far as I know, graphs are one-dimensional simplicial complexes, right? Oh no, yeah, yeah. So we are not considering the graphs as simplicial complexes in this case at all. They are the vertices of the simplicial complex that you will be creating. And so then we are not thinking of the graphs as simplicial complexes. And what are the edges? Um. Okay. So. A graph is connected. Okay, so let's take a graph G and a disconnected graph G and attach so by some. Disconnected, by disconnected, you just mean it's a, a collection of vertices and there are no edges. Or disconnected means the number of components no, is more than one. Components. It has more than one component. Okay. So uh, you attach an edge to it such that it still remains disconnected. So, if you have G and G plus E that is also disconnected, then those two are paired. The, there's an edge between them. That is. Okay, so that's how you are defining the matching. No, that's not how. That, that's how I'm defining my simplicial complex. What is a so, simplex for you? The, the simplices are the disconnected graphs. They are the zero every, cells. Yeah, they are the zero cells. And Sorry, what is a the one cell? Um, so G is G comma G plus E is a one cell. If um, if G plus E is also disconnected, that's all. Which means the edge went into one of the components itself. That's right. Yeah. No, not You're necessarily. It can connect two components, and there may be other components still. It, the only condition is that it has to be disconnected. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to look at it, look down at it at the most elementary level, which means. You look at it as just in so the sort of a universal graph where 
I am looking at the components, each connected component. So each of these component gives you a vertex in your simplicial complex, right? Uh, no, the graph itself. If, if I take any disconnected graph G, it is yeah. a vertex in my... So let's say if that disconnected graph is G, then its components are G1, G2, GK. I am looking at G1 and G2 itself. Okay. Okay. G1 and G2? You said That's consider right. graphs on the vertex at this. You don't say right. you have to necessarily consider graphs which are disconnected. See, um, you read the next line of your definition and you'll understand what I'm saying. Basically, yeah, so you look at two graphs. graphs and then these two graphs are two vertices in your simplicial complex and they form a one simplex. If you add an edge and it goes to either of these components and not an edge between the two components. Okay. So, so uh, in some sense, you are just completing the components to the complete graph. And to the limit, you can complete those graphs. It becomes the clique. Um, no, no, no. So, I, I mean, it doesn't seem that complicated. You it can is. connect to... <laughs> it is not complicated. Maybe because you're not uh, getting what I'm saying, you're finding it complicated. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, is... Uh, okay, I'll get back to you later. Everyone else mm -hmm. is uh, able to connect the two things which Anupam presented and what Maitri has just presented for the posets and the simplicial complexes. Is it clear to everyone? All of you can unmute yourself. We can talk right now. So whatever Anupam did was for posets. And now once you have a simplicial complex, you can look at its face poset. Everyone understands what a face poset is? You start uh, with zero cells. They are at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then whenever two zero cells form a one cell, something on the first level comes and you put an edge. And like this, you create your face poset for that simplicial complex. So whatever Maitri has told, if a, all of it is translated for, in terms of the face poset, then what Anupam told holds true. Okay. And ultimately what uh, collapsing, etc. she was saying is that uh, once you know the matchings and how they are matched with each other, the leftover things, which is uh, what we call as critical points, they tell you what critical points are left gives you enough information that how much you can collapse your simplicial complex to.